Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Bill Chamberlain, and I lead the global sales and marketing teams here at Varex. For those of you that are new to Varex, we are a leader in providing audiovisual solutions for the modern workplace. For over 70 years, we have helped organizations leverage ever-changing business communication solutions to solve problems and grow. With our global presence, Varex is proud to help organizations use their current audiovisual solutions to meet an entirely new set of business challenges. Our panelists on today's webinar bring a cohesive view of the dynamics continuing to unfold across the globe and how audiovisual technologies can best be utilized. To start, I'd like to introduce Jason Gago. Jason is our project engineering manager based out of our corporate headquarters. I was lucky enough to do a three week tour in Asia. I think it was about 10 years ago visiting clients with Jason. He amazed me both in his technical knowledge, but even more so in his ability to explain and educate other people, regardless of their various technical or non-technical skills. Jason, really excited to have you with us today. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Bill. Pleasure to be here. Next, I'd like to introduce Tom McNerney, our senior design engineer. Tom joined us at Varix a little over three years ago and brought with him over 30 years of audiovisual experience in conferencing and broadcast technologies. Tom supports a number of our enterprise clients and the development of their global standards. He is a rock within our organization and our go-to designer for best in client-based solutions. Good morning, Tom. Hey, Bill, thanks, excited to be here. And last, I would like to welcome Ben Dandola Grubb, our Vice President of Engineering Services. This will be our last webinar in the series and 2020 has been what can only be described as a year we would all like to put behind us. Ben has not only been the moderator for this entire webinar series, but he developed the concepts and content of the series as well. It was a great way for Varix to share both his and his whole team's incredible technical knowledge and tremendous real world experience. Thank you, Ben. Good morning, Bill, thanks. I would also like to thank all our attendees for joining us for our last webinar this year. Don't forget the basics, audio, video, lighting. Today, we're going to focus on what is required to ensure a great conferencing experience. Before we start, I want to cover a few quick administrative details. First, we're recording today's session and we'll make a replay available as soon as we have, as soon as it's available as we have with our previous webinars. Additionally, we will be having a Q&A period at the end of the webinar. Please be sure to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in any questions. And with that, my final introduction this year, Ben, I'm going to turn it over to you. Excellent. Thank you, Bill. So as Bill just mentioned, we're going to be talking about audio and video and lighting as they relate to conferencing. And it's going to apply whether you are at your home office, maybe you're sitting in your kitchen on the living room couch or in the corporate office or in your classroom. The same concepts will apply throughout. We're going to talk about how, what goes into it, maybe even science here a little bit. And then how do we enhance and give the best possible user experience by leveraging what we know, audio, video, and lighting. So to tackle this, we're going to jump right in and start by talking about audio. Uh, Jason, at a simple or a high level, could you tell us why audio is important? Well, audio is one of the primary conduits of communication. It helps us engage one another and collaborate and work together. So uh, having audio as one of our forms of communication is delivers much more information than maybe reading an email or reading a letter. Basically our starting point in a conversation. So Tom, a next simple question here, how, maybe it's not simple, uh, how would I know if I have good audio? Well, it may not be simple, but there's a few things, Ben. First off, um, most of the time, people aren't gonna be shy to tell you your audio sounds bad, or they'll say something like, I can't understand you very well. So people are pretty quick to point that out. Um, when your audio is good and the transmission between your, your site and the far site is good, communicating feels effortless. Um, it's almost as if you were in the same room, three feet apart, let's say, and just able to communicate without any barriers with regards to audio. So let's establish that as our baseline goal. When it comes to audio, you and I will communicate with one another as if we're a few feet apart in the same room, right? Simple Perfect. way to look at it. And right. we don't want it to matter if we're on the other side of the world or actually in the same room, which we haven't been in quite a while now, but we will eventually, don't worry. <laughs> That's right. Um, so we've talked about the audio being effortless. Jason, what are some of the ways, or what happens when it's not effortless? And we have the word fatigue written here on the screen. Well, when you have an audio you know, call that's um, poor in quality, uh, you no longer have an effortless 
you know, form of communication, you have to actually start using your brain um, to actively listen. And you actually start using your horsepower up there. Um, and the longer you use your brain, as far as thinking and actively listening, you become fatigued. And if you become fatigued during a call, um, you start to lose focus over time. Um, I don't know about you, but I've had several calls with uh, poor audio quality and I just couldn't stay focused through the entire duration. And those those effects even happen after the call. Say the call's ended, um, you feel fatigued after the call and that rebound period to where you can actually become productive again, it takes longer. So that rebound period, again, when you're actively listening, you're using that, your brain power versus, uh, Well, Tom said effortless a minute ago yeah. and that seemed like a yeah, good effortless. explanation to me. Thank you. So I think it's important that we point out that we're talking about an actual physical tiredness or physical fatigue. I want to go take a yeah. nap. I can't just jump into the next call because of what's coming out. And you may not even realize that poor audio was the reason why you feel the way you feel. And then so the flip side, getting back to the question Tom was talking about good audio, it means you don't think about it. We just talk. We just communicate. I hear you. You hear me. You just don't think about it. And that's going to apply to the rest of our conversation here. The best experience was going to be if you don't notice any technology, it just allows you to have that freedom of communicating. So let's move on to the next step here in terms of creating a, an environment where good audio is possible. And I will absolutely argue that we're not going to start with technology. We're going to start with the room design itself. So Jason, what things should we be thinking about when it comes to room design before technology? Well, the first thing is when I walk into a room, I kind of just pay attention to what I hear. Ideally, the room should be very quiet, you know, very, very quiet. Um, do I hear people talking next door? Do I hear uh, HVAC, uh, you know, wind noise from the vents above? Do I hear police or fire sirens? Um, all those factors play in, uh, they play into the importance of uh, the acoustics of a room. That all makes sense. So I think, Tom, one of the next obvious parts to this, at least to those of us who think about this regularly, are the surfaces in the conference room. Um, what should we know about different surface types that might be, and it doesn't have to be in a conference room. We could be talking about your kitchen. Same ideas. Yeah, you're right, Ben. It could be any room. It really doesn't matter. Um, let's first establish one quick baseline, direct sound versus indirect or reflected sound. So when surfaces come into play, let's talk about two types, hard and soft. A hard surface is gonna reflect sound and create a bunch of indirect sound within the room, which is really a bad thing. Um, the good thing with hard surfaces is they look fabulous. Everybody loves marble or terrazzo or granite, and of course, beautiful glass partitions and glass windows, but they uh, really create a lot of havoc with, with audio in a room. So uh, on the flip side, soft surfaces, any types of um, uh, fabrics, uh, carpeting, things like that, they're gonna absorb sound, which is something that we're after. We wanna get rid of the indirect sound as much as possible. Got it. So Jason, Tom's mentioning direct and indirect sound. How does that relate to the conferencing experience or even just talking with each other? Oh, sure. So basically, uh... Audio is a lot like light um, where, you know, there's a, a source of audio or a source of light and everything else is reflected off of a wall or table or, or some other piece of furniture. Um, a majority of what we hear or see is reflection, um, whereas actually very little comes from the source direct. So in a case like this, I'm speaking out of my mouth and the microphone is right here. So this is direct audio. And if we were in a conference room, uh, you would hear a lot of indirect audio as well, bouncing off the walls and glass. So it sounds like our goal with a microphone is to pick up direct audio and not the indirect. Correct. One of the yeah, examples- Think of it, uh, Ben, I'm uh, sorry. Uh, think of it like um, the microphone is an ear. It hears things. It hears what our ears hear. So if you're hearing a lot of indirect audio, uh, the chances are good that the microphone's hearing that as well. That makes perfect sense. One of the quick example was that my first week on the job in AV years ago, one of the 
guys had been around said, let's go on a quick field trip. We're going to Bell Labs and I'm taking you to an anechoic chamber. So we walk into the anechoic chamber. It's a 30 by 30 foot cube, it had chicken wire across the midpoint of the room. So you're suspended with air above and below you. These were four foot thick walls and an anechoic chamber absorbs all sound all echo there is zero echo so you could feel your heartbeat you could hear yourself breathing and it was a very very strange and unique but very interesting experience um tom what are some of the other things that might cause background noise in any room and i guess we're going to properly terminology would be ambient noise yeah ambient noise or background noise either or but ambient noise is a good a good uh, name for it. And as you can see on our slide deck here, HVAC is the typically the number one culprit. So your heating and ventilation and, and air conditioning, uh, quite often it's it's loud when it kicks, you can hear it kick on and kick off. That's never a good thing. You'd like it to be consistent. And we're, we're trying to get our room ambient noise somewhere around that 35 dB range as far as its top level. If we can uh, accomplish that, we'll be doing a really good good job with that room and we'll be able to treat it um, with electronics very well because the ambient noise is so low. Can you give me a reference point? What does 35 decibels mean in the grand scheme of things? Sure, pretty easy, Ben. So if you and I were three feet apart just having a normal conversation, that decibel level is probably around 60 or 65 dB. If we were talking with each other at a very, very quiet whisper, that decibel level is down near 35 or 38 dB. Okay. And I think one of the natural takeaways then is that if my room that I'm in has a high ambient noise, I'm going to naturally start talking louder, which would also contribute to the fatigue that we were talking about a minute ago. Yeah. Um, Jason, when it comes to room design, I think one of us said it a couple minutes ago, glass walls. We've all seen it. It's a very popular aesthetic nowadays. Um, does that mean we can't do conferencing? Because Tom was saying glass is a hard surface that's reflective. Well, so let me go back. And, and I remember one time I was in a, in a room where uh, the architect did a great job. Uh, they built this beautiful conference room uh, kind of floating in the middle of an atrium. And it had glass walls and glass ceilings and stone top and, and a stone floor. And it was a very reflective surface um, because glass itself is basically an acoustical mirror, it just bounces everything around. Um, and you couldn't have a conversation person to person. Uh, so let alone a phone call, that would have just not worked at all. Um, but you can have those views that you paid for and want to have through various products. Uh, you know, like, the most Because my window one. looks out at Central Park. I want to maintain my view. You can't close my drapes or my shades. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, the most common one is drapes or shades. Uh, you know, Venetian blinds really don't work. So those are right out the window. Forget about those. But there are films that you can buy that are transparent and you can put in front of the glass so that you can maintain the view of Central Park or maybe back into that atrium. And they're fantastic and can help, help get you that room the way you want it to sound. That sounds really cool. And Tom, maybe we don't always have glass walls. Are there other absorption solutions that are out there and available? There are, uh, Ben. Uh, artwork. Artwork is a great place to start. And these days, and it can be even be almost DIY, but you can have your logo or any information about your company on a beautiful uh, canvas of sorts. And it's a sound absorbing panel behind. So it's actually providing a nice piece of artwork in your room. And it's also absorbing sound. So again, we want to try to absorb those reflected sounds. So maybe the sound bounces a little bit off the glass and then these, these absorb, absorption panels will absorb it and get rid of that reflected sound. That's pretty cool. So basically nowadays you can pick any artwork you want. It can be printed on these specially made absorptive panels, which are not going to be any more expensive than buying artwork itself. And then now it's going to help improve the audio in our rooms. And I was just sitting here thinking about indirect sound and bouncing, thinking about a cathedral. It's made out of stone. Most people have probably had that experience where you've been in a room which is extremely reflective and bouncing around, audio is bouncing around everywhere. That's where audio as it comes to conferencing is going to be more of a challenge. And there's plenty of things you can do to, to work into that. And so the next aspect to talk about is how we pick up that audio, which would be microphones. Jason, could you give us the brief overview of microphones? 
Sure. Uh, without getting too, too deep, uh, you know, a microphone is just a device that takes sound waves or sound pressure and converts it into electricity, and then we can process it there. Um, microphones come in a couple of different flavors, you know, uh, the first one being an omnidirectional microphone. And just like its name, it's omnidirectional, all directions at once. And then there's another one called a cardioid microphone. Um, and its name is from the cardioid or, or heart-shaped pattern. And there's a couple others. Um, basically, we want to use the right microphone for the right room type and to help get direct audio versus indirect audio. So I guess what you're saying is that the closer my mouth is to my microphone, the better, but that's not necessarily always an option. Meaning, traditionally, we were drilling holes in tables and putting a microphone for every one or two people. Those microphones had the cardioid pattern that you were just describing, um, but we're not always doing that. That's become less and less frequent. Um, Tom, I've seen a lot more ceiling mics used recently. What are your thoughts there? Oh man, I'll tell you, Ben. Uh, <laughs> ceiling mics were a bad word ten or twelve years ago, right? You walk into this beautiful boardroom and there's these ten or twelve or fourteen pencil microphones hanging down from the ceiling. They were uh, they're pretty ugly. Let's let's face it, and they also didn't do a great job. But um, several manufacturers over the last decade have really come around with some. Uh, superior designs. We're at the point where we're starting to bend the laws of physics a little bit here and ceiling microphones no longer have to be an obtrusive object within your room. Some of them actually look like a ceiling tile and uh, they just kind of disappear into the into the scheme of the room, which is great. And Jason, how what, have you seen these types of ceiling mics used? Well, I've seen these ceiling microphones used when um, you have a, a very active speaker who's on the move to pick up a specific area, or maybe you have a, you know, a multi-purpose room where the tables are constantly shifting, so you have no real defined area, or maybe you have a space where you do a lot of lunch and learns, um, and you have constant papering on the table. You know, anything that would uh, be prohibitive to have a microphone on the table. Uh, the ceiling microphone really comes into play. Um, I also wanted to share a funny story where, you know, I came from a, um, a job site where we were removing the ceiling microphones and installing one of these new uh, ceiling microphones and the microphones hang from the ceiling and they look like a golf ball. My, my daughter thought it was like a, an AV pinata and she wanted to hit it when I showed her what it was. It does sound like fun. <laughs> Did anything good come out when they hit them? Any kind of candy or anything? Just some resistors. <laughs> so after we talk about microphones, the next step is how do we hear, which would be the speakers and audio coming to my ears. Um, Jason, what are the basics about frequencies and sound reproduction? Sure. Well, speakers uh, do the exact opposite of a microphone. They take uh, electrical signals and convert it into sound pressure or sound waves. Um, but not all frequencies are created equally. Uh, lower frequencies tend to be a little bit more omnidirectional, again, going in all different directions, where the higher frequencies start to become a little bit more focused, like a, like a flashlight or, or laser beam. And, and, and the higher the frequency, the more focused it becomes. So when you have a speaker, um, as you become a little bit off axis, off to the side, you start to hear the low stuff, but not the middle or the high stuff. So, you know, it's fine if you're listening to an Isaac Hayes song, but if you want to have good intelligibility, good audio fidelity, you want to give everybody the best seat in the house. So what you do is you actually give them proper speaker coverage, place a speaker every so often so that you can give everybody ubiquitous coverage. And I guess you'd also want to think about where the people are going to be located in your room. If it's a table with 12 seats, pretty easy. But now if you have gallery seats on the side, you probably want to cover that as well. Or if now if you're in a larger auditorium, I'm sure there's other types of speaker arrays that you'd be using there as well. Uh, Tom, one of the other aspects that we often deal with, and this is more for the larger boardroom conference space would be voice lift. How do you tackle voice lift? Well, you're right, Ben. This would typically be used in a much larger room. And uh, the, the, the problem that you want to solve is if someone's speaking at one end of the room and participants at the far end of that room can't really hear you and there's a big lack of intelligibility, voice lift might be a, a good option. So essentially, it's very, very low level amplification of a talker's voice it's gently increasing their the talker's perceived volume. And what we're basically doing is in an electronic world, we're moving the talker closer to the listener by way of a voiceless system. 
So it sounds like you're going back to that original goal that we established a few minutes ago of making it sound like you and I are in the same room, I don't know, That's maybe right. four feet apart. And it does, right. now it doesn't matter if you're on the other side of the world or maybe 30 feet away because you're the CEO sitting at the head of the boardroom table. That's right. I and still hear you the same. Even though we talk about amplifying the voice, it's not to be confused with amplifying a singer's voice at a rock concert. We're not talking about that. This is almost indiscernible. It's just that you know that the person is speaking and the intelligibility is there. You can understand every word they're saying because we very lightly lifted their, their voice through the speaker system. I heard that you're building a studio in your house. I am. I am. No rock concerts, though. Oh, but that probably plays That's into what me. we were talking about a minute ago um, <laughs> with the acoustics, right? I imagine yeah. that in your studio, you want absorptive or do you want reflective? Yeah, absorptive. And I also want um, diffusion, too. So diffusion, not something that we've discussed too much. Don't want to go too in depth, but it scatters audio as opposed to absorbing it. And there's a benefit to that as well. But, you know, speaking of absorptive panels, build your own. It's There's really um, not much to it. And there's also a lot of companies out there that are offering really nice panels that uh, fit into a lots of different decor. So it's, an, it's a pretty easy thing to do to treat your room these days. And again, Ben, this isn't just the conference room. This could be your kitchen. This could be your living room or wherever you happen to be. And all rooms can can have some type of an acoustic problem. It doesn't matter how big it is. Yep, that makes perfect sense to me. So as we've walked through the steps of audio in terms of designing our room, thinking about our microphones, their placement design based on the use case, and now all of our speakers, the next step in our conversation would be video. And we're gonna focus on cameras as they relate to video. And Tom, at a baseline, why do we use cameras and how do they enhance my experience? Well, um, you know, cameras basically think of them as a as a courtesy device. Um, what that's going to do is introduce body language and facial expressions that now are part of our everyday means of communicating, really, right? And it adds greatly to emphasizing our speech. Um, well, so I guess that makes sense, right? Now that yeah. you and I talk more on Zoom than we do in person, that we're trying to bring that experience more closely into the in face to face. So it, again, it goes back to that goal. How do we achieve that feeling, that experience of being in the same room, right? Right. Feeling. That's a good one. Just like Simon and Garfunkel said, uh, they give us those nice bright colors. That's what a camera is going to do for you and add to the add to the overall um, quality of your speech. So Jason, how about a little bit about the technical aspects here in terms of optics and how cameras capture light and capture color? Uh, you know, cameras are a lot like microphones, you know, they take uh, light waves and they, you know, convert it into electrical signals. Again, everything's being done via equipment. And um, to capture the, that light, you know, it has to go through essentially a couple of pieces of glass or like magnifying glasses strategically uh, placed so that it can focus in on that sensor. Um, and then with that, you have proper lighting in the room, good lighting levels, not too little, not too... Uh, bright or dim and accurate color reproduction so that you're not too orange or too blue like a Smurf. Um, and if you have all those, you're going to have a good camera image. What What's a Smurf? I think I remember hearing it, but enlighten me, Jason. <laughs> well, if you didn't grow up watching uh, Saturday morning cartoons in the 80s, I don't know if you'd know. I, I You know what? I don't think I did. I think the Smurf revolution, my daughters were probably begging me to take them to a Backstreet Boys concert or something. <laughs> <laughs> we had a bag of plastic toy smurfs in my house yeah i guess so, i missed it back to cameras here for a minute <laughs> um part of what jay was just saying about capturing light and color is going to relate to lighting and we're going to get to that in a few minutes but i have seen a 720p camera look absolutely stunning and a 4k camera look so so at best and i think there's a lot to do with the camera themselves but it's also the lighting. So we'll save that for a few more minutes. Um, Tom, there's two different types of cameras that we use. The traditional video conference room had these PTZ cameras. Could you please define PTZ? Uh, sure, Ben, it's pretty easy. Uh, basically, it's the three axes of which um, the mechanical camera moves. So panning is your left and right or horizontal movement from the camera. 
Uh, tilt is your up and down or vertical movement. And the zoom is the camera's lens mechanism moving back and forth to either capture um, or frame up from a distance or frame something up really close. So there's your pan, tilt, and your zoom. And the camera is physically moving. It's a mechanical device. Okay, so that's the one, obviously you just said, I'm just gonna say it again anyway. The camera is physically moving. You can see that camera moving. There's a variety of cameras now that are just static cameras and they're still doing some type of zooming or pan and tilting. Um, what's the difference there? I guess it's mechanical and digital, right? Yeah, pretty much. Um, there's a trade-off um, that we should understand too with, with the mechanical PTZ cameras the field of view is going to be narrower. It's relatively about 70 or 80 degrees, give or take. Uh, whereas the fixed cameras often have a much larger field of view, maybe 120 or even 130 degrees. So using those two types of cameras in the, in the proper setting and environment is really important. So let's take one step back and talk about field of view for a minute. And Jason, for any of us who are not intimately aware way the way you and Tom may be, what is field of view? Well, uh, I think the best way I can explain field of view is like kind of how you see through your very own eyes. Um, if I were to take my hands and kind of put it right here and then I'll move my hand backward to about here and I'll take this hand and I'll move it backward to about here and here's my field of view. Well, cameras work the same way. They have a, um, you know, along the horizon, a left to, white, uh, left to right area of view, that's what we call field of view. And that's often measured in degrees. Uh, so, you know, a lot of cameras can be anywhere from 70 degree uh, field of view to maybe 110, 120 uh, degree field of view. So we're talking a horizontal angular measurement here, in the, not vertical, not diagonal, but how wide can my eyes see? Or Correct. same idea is how wide can the camera see? So I want to give it back to Tom for a second. So now that we've defined that, could you get us back into the use cases for a minute? Because you were saying, Tom, that a, a mechanical traditional PTZ camera typically has a narrower field of view. You said 70 to 90 degrees, but these digital all in one, maybe in a bar style camera, mm -hmm. microphone speaker has a much wider. What are the use cases here? Where would you use one? So that, so that camera that's in a bar, a, a camera sound bar or, or one of the really small miniature cameras are great for small huddle rooms. They've got that nice big wide field of view like Jay was just mentioning. And if you're in a little huddle room, the table's pushed up against the wall or something like that, and there's three or four of you there, perfect. That camera's gonna do a great job for, for that application. But don't expect that camera to do a good job trying to focus in and frame up somebody's face from 20 feet away. It's just not meant for that. That's where you wanna think about using a PTZ camera. It's got the narrower view. The optics are gonna have a better zoom and you're gonna be able to get into the back of the room, focus in on one or two people there so they don't look like little little ants. You know, So it's not like one is better and one's worse and one's good or one's bad. There's use cases. Right. It's the application. Absolutely. So to reiterate, if I'm in a huddle room, I may be sitting at a table that's literally butted up against the wall. So my face could be as little as two feet away from that camera, maybe three. And so you need that 120 or 150 degree field of view to catch me, to get me in the image in the first place. Um, and then on the flip side, I'm 30 feet away in a boardroom table. I'm going to need that 12x, 20x optical zoom. And when you're doing that, it's still using that full image sensor as the camera is zooming in on me. So I'm not degrading the image quality in any way. Whereas if I'm trying to zoom in digitally, I'm using less and less of the actual pixels. Uh, on that sensor. But I think this relates to our next topic here as we keep moving along in the conversation and the story of the cameras, it's tracking and framing. So I said a couple minutes ago that the traditional conference room had these PTZ cameras. So you walk in, there's a touch panel on the table. There are buttons to make it zoom in and out and make the camera move and then these preset buttons. But that's the old school methodology nowadays. Nowadays, we are wanting to use tracking and framing so let's start off by defining the difference between the two, because I think in some cases people are using those terms interchangeably, but they are different. Um, Tom, what's the difference between tracking and framing? Yeah, you're right, Ben. There is a big difference. Um, we'll start with the tracking cameras, which are customarily used in, a, let's say, a lecture hall. Um, the professor's at the front of the room. He's going to wander back and forth as he's given his lecture or whatever. A tracking camera is going to stay right on him, stay focused, stay with him watch what he's doing, moves when he moves, 
and keep him framed up at all times. Um, with cameras that are more feature rich on the framing aspect, they're gonna look at what's going on in the room with, with their AI capabilities. And they're gonna basically frame up the people in the room. Let's say there's two people talking at the table. It's gonna notice that they're gonna frame up the two people. If a third person walks in and sits down next to those two, the camera's gonna make an adjustment there and reframe so that all three people are, are being seen. So I think generally the framing is mostly a static shot and it's only changing as someone else walks into the room or someone right. stands up. Yeah, it is It is static, Ben. You'll see the camera make some changes. They're very subtle usually, and uh, um, it's a very gentle movement, but it's not tracking. It's, it's just adjusting its frame. And then tracking makes sense, as you were describing, in the lecture hall or the K-12 through classroom or the corporate training facility. There's one main person who's the important one in the room. So there may be people in the room in person, but there's also people elsewhere who are joining in and participating and they need to see and hear the professor, the teacher, the trainer. Um, Jason, we were talking about, and I wanna get in a little more detail here, but differences between the fixed cameras and how they're doing this zooming versus the the PTZ cameras. Um, on the fixed cameras, I'm not, I don't see anything moving. So what, what are they actually doing to make that possible? So <clears throat> on the fixed camera, they have, a, you know, maybe a, an image sensor. And what ends up happening is they, they focus in on a specific area. I mean, they do like this magic pseudo zoom where you're only focusing in on a little bit of that canvas. Um, so these cameras have some intelligence built in and know exactly what to do, where to zoom in and where the people are to help, you know, get rid of any negative space so that you can only focus in on the people. So let's talk about resolutions, right? So a lot of those camera types have a 4K sensor. Um, are you actually transmitting that to your Zoom call? No, you're not transmitting 4K on your Zoom call, at least not right now in today's world. But, you know, technology, you know, changes ever so quickly um, to where in a couple of months we might be doing 4K. Yeah, but as of right now, no, we're not doing 4K over a video call. Um, so what ends up happening is say you have that 4K sensor, you do that pseudo zoom, you may actually be uh, focusing in on maybe 720 pixels or 500 pixels, depending on what the camera chooses. So it's partially based on what the camera's choosing, but then you're transmitting to your call. I know I've noticed that the average zoom call, I'm transmitting at 360p. It's really not a high resolution at all. So if I have 4K sent, you know, number of pixels to work with, as I zoom into a certain area, I can get pretty tight, but I'm still, continuing to transmit the same number of pixels to the far end of my call. Correct. Um, Tom, is there anything else that we should talk about here in terms of like facial detection? How are these cameras doing it? Well, yeah, there is a uh, facial recognition is, is certainly one way. And uh, I know that, you know, we've been through a bunch of uh, demos ourselves, you know, testing out a few cameras and um, one recently where um, wearing our, our masks actually caused some problems for the cameras. So I think what we're hearing is that um, manufacturers will come out with firmware updates for the cameras that may uh, be necessary to, to get around that issue. So uh, facial recognition is certainly one big way of uh, auto framing cameras and how they work. You know, I think you said AI a few minutes ago in terms of how this works and I, that's artificial intelligence, obviously. So it's seeing you, it knows you're a person. Um, and depending on the camera nowadays, if we're in the room together, we're probably wearing a mask. Hopefully we won't be. Yeah, soon right. enough in the future, um, but they are working on those firmware updates. Some cameras work with masks today and some just don't. <laughs> right, so unfortunately it's a reality for right now, but uh, like you said, sooner or later it goes away, right? Get yep. back to normal. <laughs> yep, so let's talk about lighting, which is the, the last magical ingredient here that we were talking about to enable the cameras to work properly. But also if we take it back to that original goal of being in the same room together, we, we obviously want to see each other. Um, Jason, you were saying that good lighting can make a decent camera look great. Why? Well, if you have good lighting, good lighting on the face, you know, good lighting at the table, and then good lighting in the background, you know, being not too bright or not too dim, so you're not being, you know, you don't look like a silhouette in the foreground. Um, the camera doesn't have to do any real 
uh, additional adjustments or any gain. Um, if you have very low lighting, what ends up happening is the camera has to use some sort of ampl amplification or gain into the image. And as you do that, you also amplify the noise in the signal as well. So it ends up coming across as grainy. Uh, if you have proper lighting, you, none of that happens. You come through nice and clean. Got it. So I think the next part of our conversation here is color temperature. Tom, what are the basics that we should know? Oh, well, first uh, temperature, and we just talked about mass. So let's not get too worried. We're not talking about having a temperature or fever getting tested, right? Um, color temperature is actually pretty simple. Um, so there is a scale by which we measure this. It's called the Kelvin scale. And we'll start at the low end of 1,000, and then we'll work up to the high end of 10,000. And those Kelvin units um, are determining how your light is going to look. And you can see on our, our slide deck here, on that low scale of around 1,000 Kelvin, lighting seems to be very warm. It typically will have a little bit of a, a yellow ambient hue to it. Um, and then if we move over to the high end of the scale, 10,000 units, um, lighting is going to be extremely bright. It's going to have somewhat of a blue hue to it and might be too bright for video conferencing. And we're trying to focus in on that middle range somewhere in the 5,500 to 6,500 Kelvin, which is simulating daylight basically. And that's a good, a good place to be for uh, lighting up your room for video conferencing. So uh, let's do a quick reference example here. I'm sitting on the couch curled up in front of the fireplace. Where do I land in the scale? You're dimly, two, dim lights and yeah, 2000, 3000, something like that. You know, it's the fireplace is, is something like that. Right. And now it's I'm going to the AD. dentist. Right. And so now I'm going to the doctor or the dentist and, and yeah. where am I there? most likely. <laughs> yeah. The, in the operating room, they put that big light on you. That's about as blue and hot white as it can get. Right. 10,000 yep. units. So they can see every, every little thing. I think you said a minute ago that we want to end up with our lighting in the conference area somewhere in the middle of the scale, where's the sun fall? Or did you already say that? No, I didn't, but you know, sun's in the middle, you know, I, I, obviously it changes based on time of day and geographic location, but generally speaking around 6,000 uh, Kelvin is the color temperature and that's, that's day, that's your daylight, right? And you know, here's another thing, Ben, we're all learning about this over the last several years, um, whether we know it or not, you go to a store to buy new uh, bulbs for your home. Maybe you're getting rid of incandescents since they aren't really manufacturing them much. When you pick up a box of LED bulbs, the color temperature is there. It's either there by way of a symbol or by a number or maybe even both. Um, it'll tell you this, this LED bulb is uh, uh, 6,500 Kelvin. Oh, good. This is going to simulate daylight then. That's what I want. I'd imagine then there's probably a lot of experience, a lot of people out there who have never been involved with even needing to think about this. And they've, you've had incandescent for your whole life. Right. And it's this warm, nice color. And then you go out and buy your very first LED. And there's more LEDs now and than there were a few years ago. Uh, but the first time you bought it, you probably put them all in and everything was cold. And, and this yeah. high color temperature, and you're like, oh. This is yep, not comfortable for me. Seven or 8,000 uh, on the color scale, the color temperature chart. And uh, yeah, it's like way too bright, right? And so now we can all become kind of experts, you know, just read the package. Yep. It'll help, it'll guide you right through it, right? So let's bring this back and to how it relates to cameras. And Jason, white balance is the conversation here because that is part of how a camera works. But could you give us the explanation? Yeah, sure. So once a camera figures out what white is, it can actually figure out what, you know, the red is and the blue is and the greens are and every every color in between. Um, having white is actually having three equal parts of the primary colors of, of light, which is red, green and blue. And I'll give you a pretty good example. If I were to hold up a sheet of paper, it would actually just figure out, you know, what white is and all the other colors. I'm looking at our three images right now on screen, and we seem to be, Tom appears to be on the high end of the color spectrum, Jason on the low end, and I look like, to me, I look like I'm somewhere in the middle, which is interesting. We didn't do it on purpose, but it, it just looks that way right now. You got a better um, camera than we do, Ben. I have a 720p camera that's 11 years old. It just captures light nicely. But it looks great. Yeah, absolutely. So, Jason, one of the other aspects here that I've not heard people talking about in years is paint on the wall and 
paint color. Should we still be thinking about that or is that something of the past? Well, you should actually be thinking about um, paint colors on the wall. Uh, paint colors need to be pretty neutral in tone. Uh, they have neutral meaning they have uh, elements of white in there so that the camera can have good white balance. You know, I see that I'm turning a little bit more orange here as the, you know, the Shouldn't rain. Shouldn't have had that spray tan this morning. Yeah, I know. Um, but it's important to have these neutral background colors because um, the camera can help adjust focus in on, on, you know, what white is. And once it figures out what white is, it can help figure out what the blues, greens, and, and reds are and everything in between. And also having good neutral backgrounds create a um, foreground background separation. Uh, the eye will help notice or help figure out what's what should be in focus, what I want to pay attention to versus maybe something complicated in the background. So I don't get seasick from a video call per se. So let's talk about how that relates to lighting and, and the environment of me. How does the camera find me versus that wall or versus the artwork behind me? We don't want it to be too complicated, right? No, no, you want, you want the background to be very simple. And uh, if you do have something overly complicated, going back to example of the Venetian blinds we talked about before about window treatment. Um, I've seen cameras focus in on the Venetian blinds and not the participants. Um, and what ends up happening is the person becomes blurry and everything in the background becomes in focus. Well, let's talk about those blinds because that's a good topic for a moment here. If I have my blinds closed, it's not going to allow the sunlight. You know, your building might have sun coming in through your window. And if obviously if Venetian blinds, you're going to likely have leaks in vertical segments. Um, but if you close your blinds, your shades, your drapes, you're going to be keeping the sun out so you can manage the light better. So in some cases, you're thinking about the time of day as well as it relates to your conferences. Um, yeah. So, Sorry, I just wanted to say that, you know, having there are times that what like one hour in the morning, one hour in the afternoon from sunrise and, and sunset called the golden hour, you actually go through almost every iteration of that, you know, white balance spectrum. When you're staring at the sky, yeah. it's beautiful. When you're on camera on a video call, it's not the greatest. <laughs> yeah. And keep in mind, too, if you if you kill too much of that natural sunlight, remember, we want we want to represent daylight as much as possible. If you kill too much of it with your shades drawn. Uh, you may have to enter it back in by way of your lighting system just to make sure it stays balanced within the room. And if you have a rather extensive lighting system specifically designed, you could make it look like the sun is shining from the front corner. I wouldn't do that in a conference room, but maybe in your video studio of some sort. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Tom, coming back to paint, are there resources available today that I can help me choose my paint colors? There are, Ben. Um, there is a, a system called RAL, and I, I'm not going to try to pronounce what RAL stands for. You should practice your German. Because I'll, I'll butcher it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was developed in Europe, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And basically, RAL is a universal color code that it identifies colors with a number. So you take a, let's just say a medium gray, and it gets a four or five digit number, you take that four or five digit number to any paint manufacturer, it doesn't matter who it is, and order a gallon of that paint, it's going to look identical. It's that color because it's referenced from that uh, universal color code. So it can be very helpful in keeping your colors matched. It doesn't matter if it's Benjamin Moore or uh, Sherwin Williams or whatever. If it's uh, 95453, that's the number. That's my medium gray. That's what I'm going to get. Sounds good. Yeah. So we've covered a variety of great aspects of audio and video and lighting. It's not ever going to be a one size fits all. There are different use cases and we can use both environment and technology to maximize and provide the best possible user experience. Cause that's the entire goal here. Um, when it comes to conferencing, we don't want to forget about the sort the um, surfaces in my room. I don't want to forget about my microphones and my speakers and my cameras, and my lighting. It all plays a really important aspect in the design and the implementation of any room. And like we we're saying before, it doesn't matter if it's your living room or your classroom, your lecture hall or your corporate boardroom, the same concepts all perfectly apply. So Bill, I want to hand the reins back over to you to see if there are any questions that we could answer. Uh, thanks, Ben. Uh, before we start the Q&A, just a quick reminder, use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen for any questions that you may have. Um, first question that came in earlier when you're talking about audio, you mentioned that ceiling mics were not recommended for a long time, but are acceptable now. When would you recommend a ceiling mic over a table mic? 
Um, I can uh, jump in on that. Um, you know, one of the first things that comes to mind is aesthetics. Um, people are looking for a very clean look in their room. They don't want a lot of clutter on their conference table, let's say. Um, great time to put in a, a ceiling microphone. Maybe another example is um, you bring in a lot of paperwork for meetings in your conference room, maybe, you know, like drawings and plans or something like that. If you have table microphones and all that paperwork gets uh, gets to covering up those table microphones, they obviously aren't effective. So you might want to consider having a ceiling microphone. And the two use cases I'm thinking of would be movable tables. I don't want to have a complicated harness <laughs> that I have to have someone spend hours every time they want to move these tables around or even a classroom. I could have a ceiling microphone with steerable sections or microphone elements or lobes to pick up the teacher or professor in the front and generally have the student area muted, but that could be unmuted for Q&A. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, ben, staying on audio, another question that came in earlier. Does Varix have relationships with acousticians that specialize in the corporate AV market? There's two ways to look at this. You can hire, when you're doing a brand new building, a build out, an acoustician who'd be along for the ride, to help you evaluate your HVAC design, your wall, your table, your floor surfaces that takes it from the beginning. But if you already have an existing space, there are companies that can make very, very simple recommendations for two or three panels that go into a conference room to help <clears throat> reduce the sound that's bouncing around. So ben, the short answer though is yes. Our, it goes back to our artwork discussion, right? Um, where you can, you can actually purchase those types of absorptive panels with artwork. I can get a picture of my, of my Ferrari that I really want to get and put it on my conference room wall. Um, another question that just came in, with the pandemic causing many folks to improve their AV setup without really being able to change the built environment, what are some of the better plug and play cameras, speaker, mic combos that you have seen? Thomas kind of plays into our conversation we were having just yesterday. Yeah. What was what did you say your preference was? If you want to be specific about the microphones, because I was in the room, you were listening. Um, I I honestly thought for for the price point, the Logitech Meetup did a great job. And that's a USB only, which isn't exactly controllable. So it depends on your application. Are you building a basic Zoom room in maybe? A right. 10 foot by 12 foot conference room, I think that could be a great solution. Right. And that, remember, that's a fixed camera, no PTZ there, other than a little bit of digital zoom or something. That but would be plugging in into a computer. Correct. Exactly. But it, it, did, it definitely um, looked good and it sounded good too. One of my other preferences, if we only look at the cameras coming out of the more recent products they're coming out, was the Aver 520 Pro. I liked mm -hmm. how that was doing the framing and also the image quality going to the far end of the call. And that was a it, mechanical PTZ. Right. And they, they do make mechanical PTZs and their, their movements are very, very smooth. I am excited about the Bose VB1, which is still in beta, but coming out that it's going to be a competitor for these other bar solutions. But again, that's just a, a USB solution, unlike something like the Poly X50, which are an all-in-one. And that has the brain um, or your codec built into it. So you don't yeah. have to have any of the peripherals. Correct. All right, another question that came in, and this is more about <clears throat> the webinar that we're hosting. Are you using the Zoom green screen background option? I am not. I have virtual background without a green screen. I am using the Zoom background with a green screen, and it helps give me get a little bit more definition around my headset. Um, and if I were to uncheck it, there you go. So you're green for a brief yeah. moment. And I am completely virtual background. And it also over. depends on your laptop that you're using as well. Uh, Zoom has absolutely enhanced it in the past seven or eight months because there's folks, I think, Tom, four or five months ago, you couldn't use a virtual background at all without yeah, a screen. Yeah, it kept, I kept, kept getting the message uh, um, that said, you know, I, my processor isn't powerful enough or something like that. But over the last month or two, there's been a bunch of enhancements and new rollouts from Zoom. So... Well, I tried it again and said, hey, it works. Now, and now you can put mustaches on everybody. And all, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and then there was a comment that was just posted that it's struggling a little bit with your hair on the edges, uh, Tom, compared to. And I think you can see a difference between yeah. the graphics processor and my laptop, which is, I right. guess, a more expensive one than Tom's, because we're both using the virtual background without a green screen. I think right. mine's doing a little bit better of a job, but that's the computer. That's not Zoom. Yeah, and you've you've got a much better camera. I'm using a, a pretty basic Logitech uh, camera that sits on top of my monitor. Um, certainly not the level of quality of of your professional camera. I found that I mean, mine's 11 years old. Like I was saying, you can still buy this thing for like 300 bucks online. They still make it. It's nuts. Yeah, it's a it's a good looking camera. Cool. Um, moving over to cameras, uh, what are your thoughts on 360 degree cameras? Well, my thought is, um, you know, I've seen it in use a couple of times, but it hasn't gained as much traction. Um, thinking that it would be a circular huddle table and that the camera would use some sort of intelligence between facial recognition and speech and would just zoom in on the person speaking. I thought, you know, it would have a little bit more traction, but it just hasn't taken off. Um, and you also have to take into account uh, speech back and forth and how fast the camera has to respond. And I think it also plays into how they're stitch, how that camera is stitching it's 360 degree. I don't want a really thin strip down the center of my call, but I would, you would need to have people placed intelligently so that you can use the maximum area in the image going out. And it's hard to explain that properly without showing it. Yeah, there's, I guess you would say that there's a lot of processing going on to, like you said, Ben, stitch the images together, right? From the different um, angles. I've seen a couple of, uh, not necessarily 360 degree, but really wide panorama type cameras and the stitching wasn't done well. So it looked very artificial. And some of these platforms are also good planning to do this themselves in the, thought, in the thought that if you're connecting say two or three cameras to a Zoom room or a Microsoft Teams room, it'll have its own processing to do stitching, to do active speaker or cropping and framing to show me as big as you can, because obviously it's a great experience when it's me sitting here by myself, but if there's 12 of us sitting in a boardroom, I, we're gonna be a lot smaller. Yeah. Um, next, this may be a simple question, but what is the best height for a camera? Sure, uh, I can take that one. So depending on the environment, whether you do a conference room with video conferencing or mm. an auditorium, you try to get a, a good shot that makes the person look like they're looking into the camera. Um, in the boardroom, you're typically sitting down. So we like to place a camera at eye height sitting. Um, say you have a different application, maybe the room has a camera and has some maybe tabletop uh, or bar stools. Uh, we place a camera a little bit higher so that it's eye height when you're standing or at that bar stool. So it gets that, it gives off that appearance that you're actually looking into the camera itself. All right, and uh, sticking with cameras, Ben, this is to, towards you. What exact camera are you using? Mine specifically is a Tanberg Precision HD USB. And if you wanted to go out and buy it, you would just search Cisco Precision HD USB. Nice. Uh, next, moving over to lighting. Do you have any lights you would recommend for me to use at home? Well, I can tell you what I'm using. I grabbed, <laughs> um, at the beginning of the primarily working from home, I grabbed a light that had been on the piano. We have a digital piano that uses what they call a T5 light. So if you look up T5, you can know exactly, you know, that's the type of bulb. Um, but it had been for lighting up the music book on the piano. I would certainly recommend that you use an LED and go by the, the color temperature stuff we talked about earlier. Find something in that five to 6,000 range in the color temperature and, uh, LEDs do a great job of honing right into a specific color temperature. So they're your best choice for sure. And you can spend say 30 to a hundred dollars from Amazon to buy a little rectangular light with a suction cup that sticks on the back of your laptop lid. And a lot of those have brightness adjustability, but also color temperature adjustability. So you can play with it and see how you look, how do you make yourself look best on zoom or teams, whatever you're using. All right. Only one more question here. Uh, what about the camera location while I'm working from home? I could help with that. Eye height. It should be right in the middle of your monitor. So if you get a kitchen knife out and carve out a little <laughs> hole in the middle of your monitor and put the camera right in the dead center of your monitor. Honestly, that's the best position, right? It's right at you. So you want to keep it front and center. Obviously, you don't want to be doing profile shots with your camera off to the left or the right. But 
as close to uh, your eye height as possible so that it appears as though you're looking right at each other and you're both the same height. That's what we're after. So for instance, my monitor is a little bit larger. So the top of my monitor is probably about four or five inches higher than my head. And that's where my camera is, is right at the top of the monitor, not on my head. What about uh, my laptop that has the camera at the bottom? Oh, then you're going to watch it. Everyone's going to watch it typing. Awful idea. No, it's a bad idea. So yeah, it's close to dead on your eye, eye height as possible. All right, we're coming up on the top of the hour. Uh, I just want to say thank you, Jason. Thanks, Tom, and a special thanks to you, Ben. Really appreciate the time and the insight. Um, I also want to thank everyone for joining us today. I really appreciate the feedback and the questions that we had on the, uh, on the chat. And we hope that you found this session valuable. Uh, the recorded replay will be available within the next few days, and we'll share that recording with you when we have it posted. Um, both this one and the previous webinars in this series will be available for viewing through our website. If you have any follow-up questions or would like to schedule a personal discussion, please feel free to reach out to me directly at bchamberlain at varix.com, or you can connect with any of us on LinkedIn. Thank you, everyone. Hope you have a great day. Please stay healthy and take care. Bye-bye. Hi, everybody.